You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a PhD holding historian, a professor, and the creator of History That Doesn't Suck, a podcast that makes legit, seriously researched American history come to life through entertaining stories. Join me for a chronological telling of the United States story, from the revolution to fractious civil war, tenacious inventors, brave reformers, and more. With more than 100 episodes, you can already binge listen your way from 1776 to the early 20th century. Listen to History That Doesn't Suck on Spotify. How shall I describe the past night? If I live to the allotted period of man's existence, I can never forget the scenes I have witnessed, for they are indelibly stamped on my memory. Limbs mangled and torn, much suffering and pain. Oh Lord, it was truly horrible. About two o'clock last night, we were ordered to assist our division surgeons about getting the wounded men on board the train bound for Atlanta. The wounded for the whole corps were scattered about on every side, some in a deserted house, some under rough shelters of brush, some in tents, and others on the cold ground with no covering but their blankets. By passing once through the grounds, we could find men suffering from all kinds of wounds. Here on a rough table, the surgeons were amputating a leg. On another, one's arm was being taken off, while a score of others just taken from the ambulances were awaiting their turn, with all manner of wounds claiming attention. In the hospital, after the wounds are dressed, it is bad enough, but it is no comparison to the battlefield hospital. I saw one poor fellow belonging to a Texas regiment who had his leg almost torn off by a cannonball just above the knee, the bones crushed and torn out, who had been bounced for nearly six miles in an old wagon of an ambulance over roads far from being good, yet he was still alive and perfectly reliable in speech. In moving the wounded, it was really heart-rendering to listen to their groans and cries. Several had been shot directly through the bowels, and the least movement caused them to suffer intensely. After loading three trains with the wounded, we were called upon to bury three men who had died since being brought to the hospitals. We dug a shallow grave some three feet deep by four feet wide, and laid the three soldiers in it side by side, and covering them with their blankets. We covered them as hastily as possible, for day was fast approaching, and the reports of soldiers all told us the enemy would soon be upon us. Private Hiram Williams, May 1864, after the Battle of Resaca. Thanks for downloading the 62nd episode of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello, y'all. Welcome to the podcast. In the last episode, we looked at some of the communicable diseases which afflicted soldiers during the Civil War. In fact, we said disease was the deadliest enemy of Civil War soldiers. We pointed out that an estimated three out of five northern dead and two out of three deaths among southern soldiers were caused by preventable diseases such as dysentery, typhoid fever, pneumonia, tuberculosis, and even what we think of as childhood ailments like measles and whooping cough. And so this week is the second part of our look at some of the medical issues that affected Civil War soldiers. And as promised, we're going to use this episode to look at what happened to a soldier after he was wounded on a battlefield. And just as we admitted last week, we'll say again that we're relying heavily upon the Encyclopedia of Civil War Medicine by Glenna Schroeder Lane, and we'll again recommend that that excellent resource have a spot in your Civil War library. Some soldiers described it as a sharp pinch. Others said it was more like being hit with a baseball bat or a club. Hit by a shell fragment, a Confederate soldier in the Orphan Brigade blacked out for a second. He later recalled, quote, When I came to my senses, I stood on my feet, and not feeling any pain, I could not imagine what was the matter. The first thought that entered my mind was that my head was gone. I put my hand up to ascertain whether it was still on my shoulders. End quote. 
A Union soldier in an Indiana regiment said, quote, I was struck by a mini ball passing through my right thigh and lodging in my left one. It did not fracture the bone or knock me down, but disabled me so I could not walk. When it first struck me, I did not think I was seriously hurt. I fired the charge from my gun and loaded again, and our line fell back and I undertook to follow, but my leg refused to carry me, and I used my gun as a crutch. End quote. Like both those soldiers, many wounded men, in the adrenaline-fueled heat of battle, didn't realize at first they had been seriously hurt. But then there were others who knew immediately that something was terribly wrong, because the pain and the amount of blood was stupendous, and they started pawing at themselves in a frantic search for damage. Many wounded soldiers, as their body went into shock, blacked out. A wounded Alabaman described it as a, quote, sinking sensation, end quote. He knew only that he was, quote, falling, all things growing dark. The one and last idea passing through my mind was, this is the last of earth, end quote. Well, for all too many Civil War soldiers hit on the battlefield by shot or shell, those sensations were the last of earth. And then, large numbers of soldiers were killed instantly, of course. But thousands of others, although wounded, lived. And for them, what lay ahead was a grim struggle to survive the violent injury that their body had just suffered. We talked about the mini-ball, or mini-bullet, back in episode number 46. We said it was invented by a French army officer, Captain Claude Monet, in 1848, and it solved the long-standing dilemma of mating a quickly loaded bullet with a rifled barrel. Tests proved that the mini-bullet could penetrate 11 inches of pine boards at 100 yards and nearly 6 inches of pine at 500 yards, and so the mini-bullet's effect on the human body was predictably devastating. The soft lead bullet's velocity, coupled with its tendency to distort upon impact, pulverized tissue and shattered any bones it struck. Post-war studies revealed that gunshots accounted for about 90% of all Civil War battlefield wounds, the vast majority inflicted by some variant of the mini-bullet. In contrast to the modern bullet, which tends to create a neat entrance hole, a large-caliber mini-bullet traveling at a relatively low velocity, made a dreadful wound. Because it was made of soft lead, it often flattened or deformed as it entered the body, smashing through tissue and dragging bits of clothing, dirt, and other debris into the wound. Unlike a high-velocity modern bullet, there was seldom an exit wound with a mini-bullet. Rather than passing out of the body, it tended to lodge in the hideously damaged tissue and left a large wound area open to infection. Civil War soldiers could be wounded in whatever part of their anatomy happened to be in the path of a projectile. Estimates suggest that about one-third of all battlefield injuries, both killed and wounded, were to the upper extremities, that is, arms and hands. Another third or so were to the lower extremities, that is, legs and feet and then 15% of injuries were to the head, face, and neck. And then it's thought 23% of all battlefield injuries were to the torso or trunk. However, of those killed in action, roughly 51% had trunk wounds and 42% were hit in the head or neck. Only about 8% of those killed in battle died of wounds to the extremities. In those situations, the limb was either blown off or hit in a major artery, as was the case with Confederate General Albert Sidney Johnston at the Battle of Shiloh. Roughly 70% of the hospitalized wounded had arm and leg injuries. That statistic reflects the sad reality that back in the Civil War era, a soldier hit in the head, chest, or abdomen had usually received a fatal wound. Back in those days, physicians rarely tried to operate on those complicated wounds, and even aside from that fact, at a field hospital, given the overwhelming numbers of wounded, the medical officers had to make quick decisions about who was most likely to survive and the treatment they would receive. <laughs> 
The sequence of getting a wounded soldier from the firing line to, if necessary, a general hospital many miles from the battlefield was often an arduous process. But the field hospital was the magnet to which all were first drawn, apart from the very lightly wounded or those unable to get help. Here, Rich shares the account of a Texas soldier wounded at the Battle of Chickamauga. I was severely wounded at about eleven o'clock on Sunday morning, September twenty, and lay on the field until some time in the afternoon when I was taken to the field hospital. The field hospital, located in an open field, consisted of a few hastily constructed brush arbors and a large quantity of straw spread on the ground. Hundreds of blood-covered men were lying on the straw, and the number constantly increased as the ambulance and litter bearers arrived from the battlefield. Many of the wounded were groaning; a few were crying out in their agony, while others were quietly dying. Assistant surgeons and attendants were moving rapidly among the men, giving relief as fast as possible. The head surgeons, with bared arms and wearing long, blood-stained aprons, were busy with knives and saws, amputating shattered limbs and coolly tossing them to a large pile of severed arms and legs, which grew in size. Until it was so large that it would have more than filled the body of a large two-horse wagon. To me, the place was horrible, even more so than the battlefield itself, for the enthusiasm and excitement of battle were missing. Although the thunder of cannon filled the air and the continued rattle of musketry seemed quite near. Private William J. Oliphant, Sixth Texas. Wounded soldiers came to the field hospitals hobbling on foot or on stretchers. Or half carried by comrades, or perhaps slumped over a horse's neck, or by ambulance. During a battle, field hospitals were established as close to the firing line as possible, while still being outside the range of enemy artillery. Because the lines often shifted back and forth during a battle, field hospitals frequently came under fire and had to relocate if they could. Large flags, yellow for the Yankees and red or yellow for the Confederates, were flown above field hospitals to indicate their location. That some rebels used red instead of yellow flags is evidenced by a lady's red petticoat being flown from the cupola of the Lutheran Seminary to show that it was being used as a hospital when it came under fire during the Battle of Gettysburg. During the Civil War, both armies used stretchers to remove their wounded from the battlefields. Typically, each ambulance was supposed to contain two stretchers, and those were used by official stretcher bearers, band members, or the ambulance corps. However, comrades of the wounded soldiers might use whatever was available to remove injured men from the battlefield. These improvisations included coats with muskets run through the sleeves, window shutters or doors, ladders. And even the two-person forearm clasp to make a seat that's known today as a fireman's carry. Rich mentioned band members carrying stretchers, and perhaps that needs clarification. You see, especially early in the war, when quite a few regiments still indulged in the luxury of maintaining their own bands, it was a common practice for those musicians to put down their instruments and to serve as stretcher bearers during a battle. Exactly. Um, but then there were also the ambulances. The collection and transportation of the wounded was a major problem during the first part of the war, due to both the Union and Confederacy's failure to make any proper provision for moving the injured soldiers from the firing line to field hospitals. Especially in the first year of the war, this was the cause of much unnecessary suffering and death. When the Civil War began, ambulances were in short supply. Most of those that were available to the northern and southern armies were of a two-wheeled type, pulled by one or two horses or mules. Those contraptions held at most three patients, and the jarring ride was sheer torture for those who had to ride in them. In fact, soldiers who had ridden in them nicknamed them avalanches or gut busters. By the second and third years of the war, those two-wheeled ambulances had been almost entirely replaced by four-wheeled vehicles. These came in two basic types: a light two-horse variety and a heavier four-horse type, which could carry more patients. Most of all, these four-wheeled ambulances had springs, but thanks to the Civil War's era's poor roads, ambulance travel was never very comfortable. 
It wasn't until McClellan, then commanding the Army of the Potomac, issued General Order No. 147 in August 1862 that proper organization was brought to the ambulance system. With the establishment of the Army of the Potomac's Organized Ambulance Corps, the Union's medical department developed a standard number of ambulances per regiment, and those vehicles were also reserved for medical needs rather than being subject to other uses, such as carrying officers' baggage. The following year, 1863, the Army of the Potomac's example was followed by the other northern armies. The Confederates never had a recognized ambulance corps. The plan was simply for southern armies to have two ambulances for each regiment, but even that standard was rarely met. And so Confederates used ambulances captured from Union forces, but mainly relied on army wagons, or on farm wagons, or carriages, or whatever wheeled vehicles could be rented or impressed into service after a battle. But still, members of the Confederate Medical Department frequently had trouble getting adequate numbers of vehicles to transport the sick and wounded, and then they often saw their acquisitions appropriated by a quartermaster for hauling supplies. This was because, from the very start of the war in 1861, the Confederacy had a transportation shortage, which only worsened as the conflict continued. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast, wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. Hey y'all, spooky season is here, and if you're looking for a show to whet your appetite for a little haunted history, then I'd like to invite you to check out Southern Gothic, a chart-topping history podcast that explores some of the most infamous legends, folklore, ghost stories, and hauntings of the American South. We've covered all sorts of stuff from the Bell Witch of Tennessee to the disappearance of the Confederate submarine, the H.L. Hunley. Not to mention our deep dives into the local lore of some of America's oldest and most haunted cities like New Orleans, Charleston, and St. Augustine. So if you're ready for a little good old-fashioned Halloween storytelling with a commitment to quality historical research, then be sure to check out Southern Gothic today. It's available now on all your favorite podcast apps. When a wounded soldier walked or was carried to an aid post or to a field hospital, a doctor with the rank of surgeon or assistant surgeon would examine him to determine the nature of his wound. With gunshot wounds, if there was no exit wound, the doctor at the hospital would search for the bullet, first with his little finger and then with a ceramic-tipped probe if the bullet was more than finger deep. There was no understanding back in the olden days of the need for antiseptic conditions, So a surgeon would use the same probe, knife, or saw all day long, only wiping his hands or instruments on his already bloody apron or coat when they became too sticky or slippery. With gunshot wounds, if possible, the bullet would be removed. But sometimes, due to the bullet's location, removal wasn't possible. Occasionally, a bullet worked itself out of the body after many months or even years, or the soldier retained the bullet in his body for the rest of his life. But whether the offending projectile was still in or already out of the soldier's body, the wound needed to be cleaned. After removing bone fragments, scraps of clothing, dirt, grass, and any other foreign matter that was visible, the doctor would often simply clean the wound 
with a blood or pus-soaked sponge that had already been used on other patients and just squeezed out in water. A wound might then be sewed close with silk or horsehair. Serrate, an ointment made from beeswax, was often applied to the wound. If the wound was left open, it might be packed with lint and bandaged. Of course, neither the lint nor bandages were sterilized. And this is kind of gross, but before an injured soldier reached a hospital, or even in some hospitals where cleanliness was a problem, flies often laid eggs in the wound, and the eggs hatched into maggots. Nasty as they were, the maggots only ate unhealthy tissue, and so the wounds actually healed faster than otherwise. Because of the often extensive damage caused by a mini-bullet, many wounds were not simple or straightforward, but involved seriously mangled tissue and nerves, as well as shattered bones. When these wounds were to the extremities, arms, legs, hands, and feet, amputation was sometimes the best way to save the soldier's life. You often hear that amputations accounted for some three-fourths of all surgeries performed on wounded soldiers during the war, and the standard image of Civil War amputation features a blood-covered doctor as a heartless butcher unnecessarily lopping off an arm or leg and tossing it onto a hideous pile of severed limbs. But the reality was that given the medical knowledge of the time and taking into account the often horrific damage to tissue and bones and nerves and blood vessels caused by a mini-bullet, doctors realized that it was better to sacrifice the arm or leg in order to save the patient's life. And if an amputation needed to be performed, it was better to do it as quickly as possible after the soldier was wounded. It was found that wounded men who had amputations within 48 hours usually had a better survival rate than those who suffered through the procedure after that. So if a patient would probably need an amputation, and remember, medical officers were making these assessments in a high-stress environment at an aid station or a field hospital where the vast number of wounded after a battle meant doctors had to make very quick treatment choices. But anyway, so if a patient would probably need an amputation, doctors generally performed it at once, if possible, rather than waiting to see if the wound might heal on its own and then operating during the high-risk period if it did not. As a result, most amputations occurred in field hospitals, and so we have this image of field hospitals being grim, dreadful places, which, of course, they were, certainly. The vast number of wounded after a major battle meant that hundreds of desperately injured men had to lie in filth and with the agonies of their wounds and thirst, for many hours, if not days. For example, at Gettysburg, even with amputations being performed round the clock by exhausted surgeons, there just weren't enough tables or surgeons to handle the sheer volume of work. Dr. Bushrod W. James, working at the Union's Second Corps Hospital, remembered, quote, Every surgeon in the hospital was kept nearly a week amputating limbs, probing for and removing bullets, or sewing, bandaging, and dressing wounds of those who were too badly mangled and shattered to be aided in any more hopeful manner. Every hour the improvised operating tables were full, and many of the poor fellows had to be operated on lying on the damp ground. End quote. And one other thing we wanted to point out, and that's because part of that trademark image of Civil War amputations is often that the poor patient is writhing around in agony, biting on a piece of leather or whatever, and held down by several men as the doctor saws away at his arm or leg. And we're not saying that that never happened, but the reality is that the great majority of patients, both Union and Confederate, were anesthetized during their operations. Thankfully, there were actually two anesthetics available during the Civil War, ether and chloroform, and both were used, although chloroform was preferred, not least because ether vapor is rather flammable, and so not what you'd want to have to worry about, for example, if you were in a barn or tent and operating after nightfall by candle or lantern light. But anyway, all of that's to say that, thankfully, chloroform was used for almost all field surgery during the Civil War. It's often reported that the Confederates were forced to do many surgeries without anesthesia because they were unable to get it due to the Union blockade of southern ports. But this actually seems to be mostly a myth, 
Blockade runners brought in some supplies of anesthesia, and then the Confederates also established laboratories in a number of states to manufacture it and also to research medicinal plants. And then a third source of anesthetics was capture from the enemy. Whenever the Confederates captured or raided a Union supply depot or train, one of their priorities was to look for medical supplies. For example, when Southern Cavalry captured a Federal supply train near Winchester, Virginia in May 1862, they got hold of 1,500 cases of chloroform. For all wounded patients, doctors prescribed opiates for the pain. Opiates were the most effective painkillers back then, and physicians prescribed them for many conditions. During the war, Union medical officers dispensed nearly 10 million opium pills, some 3 million ounces of other opiates, and about 30,000 ounces of morphine. No figures are available for the Confederates, but their physicians, who had similar training, undoubtedly used opiates for the same purposes in whatever quantity was available to them. Since doctors back in the olden days weren't aware of the addictive nature of opiates, soldiers who took them for chronic conditions over an extended period of time could become addicted. Not surprisingly, there are no records concerning this, but the vast amount of opiates administered during the war suggests that eventually a number of soldiers must have become addicted and remained so after the war was over. During the Civil War, because of the general lack of cleanliness of soldiers in the field, And because of the medical profession's ignorance of the role of bacteria, most wounds, from minor scrapes or cuts up to major gunshot wounds, became infected to some degree. Minor infections were seen as beneficial, since it was thought that it was the body ridding itself of toxins, but more serious infections were dreaded by injured men. They especially feared blood poisoning, what we now know to be a streptococcal infection, a condition that killed more than 90% of those who contracted it during the war. More common than blood poisoning, but equally feared, were two other serious streptococcal infections, erysipelas and hospital gangrene. Erysipelas was a severe skin infection and was extremely contagious and could be contracted in even the smallest scratch or cut. Hospital gangrene was fairly uncommon in field hospitals, but appeared more often and spread quickly in the larger general hospitals that the military located in cities or towns behind the front lines. Unfortunately, back in those olden days, penicillin and other antibiotics were unknown, and so serious wound infections proved fatal to many soldiers who otherwise would have recovered. Rich mentioned general hospitals a moment ago, and those were established by both the Union and Confederate medical services. After being treated at a field hospital, a soldier in need of further treatment and convalescence would be transported to a general hospital that held hundreds or thousands of patients and that was located in a city or town behind the lines. By 1865, there were 204 federal general hospitals with over 130,000 beds. Washington, D.C. had 16 hospitals, and an additional seven were in nearby Alexandria. In the South, by the end of the war, 154 hospitals had been created. Chimborazo, which we mentioned last week, was located in Richmond, but was like a small city in itself. In addition to 8,000 beds in over 100 wards, it included five soup houses and a bakery producing 10,000 loaves of bread every day. It was also connected to a farm with 200 cows. These general hospitals, once established, didn't usually move, except in the Confederate Army of Tennessee, where the movements of Union troops continually pushed back the Confederates, forcing frequent relocation of their general hospitals in that area of operations. But a patient could be expected to stay in a general hospital until he either recovered enough to be sent back to his regiment or a convalescent camp, was declared unable to return to duty and sent home on furlough or permanently discharged, or he died. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is an article in the January 2009 issue of America's Civil War. That magazine article is titled, 
Life is Better Than Limb, and it's a helpful resource for anyone wanting to learn a bit more about wartime amputations, about how they saved thousands of soldiers' lives, and also help spur the development of prosthetics. As always, you can find all of our recommendations at the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.blogspot.com. You can also find links there to the podcast Facebook page and also to the show's Twitter feed. In fact, we just hit 200 followers on Twitter. And like we've mentioned before, uh, neither Tracy nor I had been on Facebook or Twitter before we decided to start a history podcast. So we still get ridiculously excited about these little milestones. But anyway, if you do want to check us out on Twitter, we're at Podcast Civil War. And each day, or most every day on Twitter, we either look at what happened on that date 150 years ago during the war, uh, or we pass along an interesting article or photograph or book review or whatnot that we found on other history sites. So thanks to John B. for being our 200th follower on Twitter. And then we have a few of y'all to thank for donations this past week. There was Simon N. from Australia. Roderick M. in the U.K., Glenn B. from Ohio, and then just today, George S. in Maryland. So thanks, guys. We appreciate the support. And then we also want to thank Spiritwood Music for permission to use their song, Midnight on the Water, as the music you hear at the beginning and end of every episode of the podcast. All right, I think that's it. So we'll close by saying thank you to all of you for listening to this episode of The Civil War. 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. We hope you'll join us next time when we turn to legal matters and look at ex parte Merriman and Abraham Lincoln's controversial decision to suspend habeas corpus. So that'll be next week, but until then, take care. Thanks. Bye, y'all. y'all if you're still listening you get a little bonus since we came across this account from a yankee officer during our research for this episode and thought it's interesting on a number of fronts but we weren't sure where to include it in the episode so we're just going to put it here at the end the ground upon which we lay had been well fought over during the day and as things became quiet we heard the moans and groans of the wounded which told us that between us and the enemy were lying human beings, torn and mangled, and in agony. One in particular was determined to have relief, if making a noise would bring it. The others, perhaps worse hurt, merely tore our hearts with their piteous, stifled moans, but this fellow had strength enough to call for what he wanted. He was undoubtedly badly hurt, and his shrieks and groans grew momentarily more clamorous and insistent, mingled with bitter curses for those who could but would not help him, for he well knew that within earshot lay hundreds, if not thousands, of human beings. His speech plainly proclaimed him a confederate, and for a long time we waited for his comrades to help him. But, as time going on, we found that for some reason they were not disposed to do so, the men of the 21st determined to grow on this merciful errand at all risks. Taking a blanket to serve as a stretcher, they cautiously made their way to the sufferer, guided by his voice, which was now continuous in reproach, till at last, in spite of the shots fired at them, they brought him safely off to the rear of our lines. Here they were unable, it being too dark to see where his hurts were, to do him much good, but what they could, they did. He was wounded in several places, and in spite of all their attempts at careful handling, they could not help hurting him. He was evidently suffering intense pain. But the matter of the remarks he had to offer upon things of immediate interest were most extraordinary. He talked between groaning and by agonized jerks, and with the most fluent profanity. It were good of y'all to come out after me. Let go my leg, stranger, you're a-killin' me. Water, for God's sake. Do you want to see me die? Well, thank ye. I'll never forget ye for this, Yanks. You've done me a good turn, and I'll never forget ye for it. Y'all got the best of it today, but by jump there won't be a corporal's guard of you left by tomorrow night. 
Longstreet's done come, ye shad bellies. And so on, mingling abuse and prophecies of our coming disaster with gratitude, curses, and prayers in a manner as ludicrously grotesque as it was horrible. Our fellows gathered around him, ministering to him as best they could, in their rude, rough way, and taking no offense, but rather admiring his grit, and laughing as they understood that while he was by no means ungrateful, he could not help glorifying over the defeat he saw in store for us. At last they carried him back to the field hospital, where he was cared for, and it is to be hoped set on the road to recovery. Lieutenant Wilson J. Vance, 21st Ohio, at the Battle of Chickamauga, 